He's Howard Eibach, former copywriter and creative director and the author of two books on the creative brief. And he's Henry Gomez, an ad agency strategist with 28 years of experience. Together, he and I are the Brief Brothers. We love talking about creative briefs, briefing, and advertising. Today, Henry, we are graced with the presence of my boss at the ANA, Mark Liebert. He'll tell us more about himself. Let's join the conversation. All right, Henry, we're back with another episode of the Brief Brothers, and I'm really excited today because we're talking to my boss, even though he doesn't like that term. His name is Mark Liebert. He's Senior Vice President for the Marketing, Training, and Development Center at the Association of National Advertisers in New York. I know that's a mouthful. And I've been working with the ANA now for, I'm into my eighth year, so seven full years. I started in January of 2017. And it has been quite an education and it's been a joy working with Mark and all of his direct reports. And I, you know, I, when I reached out to him, Henry, I, I kind of lamented the fact that it's been so long. We should have had him on a long time ago because you know how much we love talking about the dearth of good training in our industry. And that's what the Marketing Training and Development Center focuses on. So here we have the senior vice president a guy who's done training himself, and he'll tell us more about that. So Mark Lieber, welcome to the Brief Brothers. We're really excited to have you. Well, thank you, Howard. And thank you, Henry, for having me. You know, I hope to live up to the expectations. Well, we'll, we'll do our best to, to put you through the ringer. All so right. as, we, as we like to do with all our guests, let's do a little background. We want to find out a bit about you. What did What kind of got you into uh what we do now for the ANA tell give us your 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 career trajectory how did you get to where you are well uh I I I never was intended in my career to get into training it was something that uh I lucked into fell into very early on in my career uh after selling uh uh financial service products Belly to belly, as I like to say, I would drive around for 300 miles every every week, 400 miles. It was actually, actually, it was in Solano, California, where this whole story starts. Oh. And uh, I was always really good talking with people and telling them about what I had and getting clients, but I hated prospecting. Boy, did I hate the prospecting part of the business. So uh, I was struggling. And you know, sometime before that, I wrote a letter to the president of the company complaining about our lineup of mutual funds. And my boss took note of that. Uh, I may have been the only salesperson he had who actually had the talent to write a letter. Uh, and so when he had developed a training job, he asked me if I was interested in taking it. And uh, I was like, well, I'm not going to be staying here long as a salesperson anyway, so might as well give it a try. And it turned out to be a perfect fit for me, frankly, because I have learning issues as a as a person. So I've always worked hard to have to figure out things to make them clear to myself, to make it organized and uh, so that I could take it in and go with it. And that 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 was actually a strength for me because teaching people something requires you to be extremely clear and concise. So after that, it was it was a, it was a quick propellant, a quick movement up to. Uh, you know, running well, as his as he ultimately became the national sales manager. I became the director of of training for this company. It was about two thousand person sales force. Uh, when there was a regime change, I was caught up in that and I was laid off. Uh, whereupon I went back and I got an MBA. Came back home to New York City, got an MBA. It was in finance, but trying to find a finance finance related job in two thousand eight when I graduated from my master's program was not the best year to do it in. <laughs> so wow. it was like. Think about the other things that I'm interested in, which was always sales and marketing. And I leveraged my training background and uh, found a job at the ENA. Uh, and it's been, you know, 15 years since as far as, uh, you know, being part of this uh, development of this uh, unit in the ANA itself. So you you did some training yourself before you yes, I, ran I, the you know, show. So what? Yeah. What were some of the topics that you that you uh, trained? And it was all related to sales and sales process. It was it was around you know the financial service tools that were necessary to you know do a sales presentation with respect to financial services. So the the things I trained on directly were all related to that sales and financial services. 
Okay, so you just you said before we hit the record button that you are celebrating or about to celebrate your 16th year with the ANA. Yes, that's right. Congratulations, by the way. Thank you. Thank you. Um, tell us about what what has happened in the last 16 years. How has your role evolved? Because I know you've climbed the ladder. You're you're in a much senior level now. But what? How how many classes or how many workshops have have uh, the has the ANA started offering? How has the this division changed in the 16 years since you've yeah. Uh, joined? Yeah. So uh, when I joined uh, the ANA, I was largely hired because I had had experience in building a training infrastructure. And when I got to the ANA, the infrastructure that existed was at its most essential levels. And when we started, when I started, it was a it was a training department that was really built around one thing, and that was in-person workshops. And uh, the the business uh, was it was just it was at its most its greatest infancy. Uh, we didn't have that many workshops to offer. We you know the ANA as as a an association, it it covers everything in the marketing ecosystem. You know everything that you can think about is a is a subject that the ANA tries to tackle, and so you can imagine if we had maybe you know twelve to fifteen workshops when I started, that was not nearly enough to capture what the ANA stands for. So it was uh, you know at, at the start it was always about building up the, the the repertoire of faculty. I mean, like yourself, you know, Howard, it was we always looking for people who had been there and done that, people who would you know or practitioners who could speak from personal experience. Uh, because the entire approach was never going to be academic, which, you know, right. comes from my background in terms of my how I am as a, as a, as a trainer and, and my learning issues. I don't want theory. I want show me how it's really done and get me to do it myself. Uh, but it's also just these are these are common. This is what you need to, do, to have in the learning development industry, you know, for good, effective training for adults as opposed to students who are you know young people. Right. So in, in, in that context, it was about building up the workshops, building up the number of workshops, building up the content breadth. You know, now we have well over 120 titles in our portfolio. It's a little crazy when I look back at it and thinking of you know, how many how, how the growth has, 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 has happened. But we're not we're no longer just doing workshops, you know, through the, the, the work directly, you know, working directly with our our members. And talking to L and D professionals and marketers charged with responsibility of development of their teams or their organizations, through those conversations, you know, if you're going to be a serious business, which I've always been about personally, it's you have to respond to customer needs, right? Our customers needed to, you know, if you look at our workshops, it started off at 10, 15, now it's 30, 35. You know, that number of people say, "What the hell should I do? What do we, tell me? What, I got all these choices. What do you think is good? What should I do?" So, you know, you don't want to offer that because that gets you into a sales type of mentality. Oh, you should do this way, that one. No, let's get this to be based upon you. So that's the first thing that we developed was a, a capability. We call it now a capability diagnostic tool. Simply put, it's an assessment. It's a survey. You know, ask your marketers to tell you what they, how they rank themselves in various different ways. And then we're going to compare the answers and then we're going to do a needs analysis based on that. You can, you know, so that was the first tool that we had. And that one started to put us on the map as being a more serious learning and development type of organization, because in addition to a workshop solution, we're also offering the strategic help to determine and prioritize limited time and budget that, you know, every member is faced with. So real quick, for those yeah. of who are listening and maybe <clears throat> are living under a rock, the ANA is the Association of National Advertisers, right? This Correct. is basically an, an organization that represents uh, a lot of the, the biggest brands in the country nationally that are doing marketing and, and specifically advertising. Um, right. How many, how many member organizations are there now currently in the ANA? We, we are the largest, you know, trade association in marketing in the United States. In the world, uh, aren't you, Mark? What's that? Aren't you the largest such organization on the planet? We probably are, but I, I'm, I, I, I don't want to, I don't know that for sure, so I'm not going to say that. You know. Okay. Well, I will. Uh, I'll just go okay. on and say it. <laughs> you know, but but we have a thousand, you know, client side marketers, which are brands, and we also have about six hundred uh, marketing service providers, is what we call them. It's consultancies, agencies, you know, media companies, you know. Uh, 
the folks on the sell side of the business can also be an ANA member uh, as well. There's also universities that that join for the benefit of their students and so forth. So there's we have a very diverse uh, client base or member base now. Uh, it's it started with client side marketers and and that's now at about a thousand. Gotcha. So you mentioned that you created this diagnostic tool to figure out like uh, among your client organizations what training was the the most needed within their organization. Which which trainings or which areas um, are the ones that have the most demand? Like where's the the most um, constant demand of say, we really need training in this area. Yeah. Yeah. You know, this may seem like I'm, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm, uh, somehow selling to the team here, but I'll tell you, briefing is always a top five problems with briefing is always a top five type of issue. Others digital. Now, of course, now this is not part of the diagnostic, but the, in terms of, you know, the question is really getting at, you know, what do people want? What are consistent needs and so forth? Well, certainly, you know, AI has reared itself up as one of the most important things that we've started to focus in on. Uh, we have two workshops on it now. We're building out four others, plus we're doing on demand and a whole other slew of things to help build out our AI muscles to help out with our with our membership. But those are really, you know, the top ones, you know, in, in general, over time, you have, you know, digital marketing, briefing, and you'd be surprised, but it's still there. It's, it's brand, brand building, mm -hmm. strategic marketing. It's, you know, what we often find is like, certainly you have some of the, some of the best companies out there, like P&G, they have their own academy. They, they are you know, probably amongst the best when it comes to the members that we've seen and work with in terms of having an own internalized system. But for the vast majority of other companies, they have nothing close to that. Uh, and frequently in many cases, and especially I see, I see this in tech companies and other companies that are more B2B oriented, it's not necessarily a, a marketing focus that they bring to bear. It's frequently they will have people who are in other divisions who are put in charge of marketing, who are moved to marketing from other divisions. And the, 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 the issues then of having a misalignment of skills and a diversity of skills, both good and bad, it's, it's, it, it gets to be pretty dramatic. And so even amongst topics like branding and, and strategic marketing, we find that those are still percolating to amongst the top selected workshops because it's not just clear cut who's going to be in that marketing organization. It's it's interesting that you mentioned PNG. I mean, in a way, PNG has been the training ground for so many marketers over, over the decades. Oh, yes. Um, they basically yes. invented modern brand marketing. And so, uh, and you see within packaged goods, there's a lot of P&G alumni out there, but even outside of packaged goods and all types of, of industries, um, it's amazing uh, what they've done. Yeah, I, yeah. I, was a I was a guest on a podcast called Forthright People, one of whom, two women, and one of the women was trained at Procter & Gamble. And she had a solid background in everything, briefing, branding, marketing, strategy. She knew her stuff. It was impressive. It's pretty, it's pretty amazing. One of the things I quickly <laughs> learned when I when I entered the ANA and I got exposed to the, you know, the whole marketing culture, the industry culture, you know, I always thought it was funny how whenever I met someone from an agency, it was hi, my name is XYZ. And then, you know, three or four, you know, the whole the resume is read out to you. It was, it was like it was always, it was it was always very funny. And and I, and to me it was funny. And I realized, you know, people why I do it, you know, anyway. Uh, it quickly became to me, it became apparent to me that that P and, P and G badge was the badge of, it was one of the first things I learned. You got, if you, if you got into the P and G and you, and you were there for, you were guaranteed success in life, no matter what you did. It was, uh, it, it, it was, to, to see that. it was true to a certain extent in the seventies and eighties. If you went, if you were a, an employee for any number of years at, at um, J. Walter Thompson or Ogilvy or some of the major you know, blue chip agencies, you too were av availed of the training that those agencies provided, which they don't anymore. Leo but Burnett. Yeah, Leo Burnett, exactly. But you could say you could you could wear that badge of honor the way someone from P and G did. And again, this is something that that Henry and I have lamented. One of our first guests was it in 2021, Henry, when we had Lance Saunders. And I think it was 2021, we had maybe 10 episodes under our belt, Mark. And Lance Saunders was my mentor on briefing. 
He was the director of strategy at Campbell Methuen in Minneapolis and pointed me to the, in the direction of John, you know, John Steele, Truth, Lies, and Advertising, and, and Sir John Haggerty, and all the greats. And we had him on our show, and he said, you guys need to talk about training, because it's just, it's just gone. And since then, you know, I've been invited to talk with, with uh, uh, college campuses. Mark, J Mark Jensen has been a repeat guest here. And I go back and talk to his, his students at the Hubbard School of Mass Communications and Journalism at the University of Minnesota. I'm doing it now with the University of Tampa, my alma mater. I've done it at Fox University in Oregon. So there are programs. And then, of course, Mark Lewis at the School of Communication Arts in London. There are more and more of these popping up. Henry's been a, a regular at the Miami Ad School, um, and he does his own. But your organization, our our organization, my organization, the one to which I, I feel a great affinity, is at a different level. It reaches so many more people, and yet the challenges still face these marketing organizations. Where do we turn our attention to to get the right training? And you say that briefing is right there at the top. Now, Henry and I love to talk about briefing, but um, you know, I remember when I signed on what January of 2017, was it Janet Moss? She was still teaching with the ANA. Jane Moss. Jane she's Moss. Now, but she's she is, passed but... away, right? And she was a giant in your in your in your stable of brief writing trainers. Yes. Uh and I think you're still using one of her uh webinars. Well, I'm not we mistaken. In, 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 in memorial, yes, we are. Because it was, it is, it is tied to the fact that, you know, she was a giant, you know, she has, you know, her own books written about it. You know, she claims that she was Peggy Olson of, of, you know, from Mad Men, you know, that that was based <laughs> on her character to some extent, you know, so she was, she was, uh, yeah, she was uh, a great, great person to know, uh, you know, she, she was, uh, she, you know, she's like five foot tall. You know, yeah. she's a giant, but five foot tall. And I was once with her doing workshops and, you know, the rental car for was a one of those giant four by fours that I would never get into, if, except that that was the car they had. And getting her into that car was a, was a major feat. But in any case, you know, <laughs> I haven't thought about her in a little while, but yeah. So what are some of the challenges that you face bringing in new, new uh, trainers? New trainers? Um, Can you get the people to talk about and? teach the, the topics that you need well it, it's the topics the topics are it's not usually hard for us to find people to talk about the topics right what, what's hard for us is to find people who understand that training is different than presenting that that training is 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 not uh it, it, that train the training is a two-way communication that you have to build with the folks that you're in the room with it, it, it it's not something that as an adult you know you, you gotta imagine the, the learner only can listen to so much before their iphone or their you know whatever it is that's in their mind will enter in and start to distract them you know they need to be engaged and so converting what is your ample source of knowledge into a experience that both teaches and engages is an art in and of itself, and one that only a certain type of people can really do. You know, you have to step back, you have to be humble, you have to understand that not every one of the ideas that you've worked hard your career to prove need to and ought to be spoken because you don't have the time to do so, or rather, if you do so, you don't have the time to really make the learning that you're trying to communicate and the experience you're trying to create work. So it, it's much less about finding people to talk about the topics and more about people who are willing to roll up the sleeves and figure out, all right, if I want to say this now, what do I have them do so they get the idea that I'm trying to get forward? And this is why we look for practitioners because they're the folks that have probably struggled on their own to figure out how to get something done. And that becomes an exercise that they can then facilitate in a classroom setting so that people can kind of get the benefit of that experience. Well, I, I could volunteer myself as a great case study for you because working with you taught me 
a hell of a lot about how to be a better instructor. And I came to the ANA after having been a college instructor for, I don't know, half a dozen, seven years. But I, I learned very quickly that, yeah, not everything that I want to say is going to stick uh, and is going to be a value. So, and, and that's one of the things I've always admired about working with you. I and mean, I don't want to get too much in the inside baseball here, but I do want to ask you, what are some of the things that you've learned over the years as an instructor yourself and now as a teacher and a, and a, a, a someone who guides others to help them become better instructors? Mm, that's a, you know, that's a good question. And uh, I'm just going to just say some things that come to my mind, but these are the principles that I tried to kind of live my life by. And I know, Howard, in your case, it, 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 it worked, right? Yes. You know, but but it, it's, <laughs> it, it's, it's, uh, to me, it's always about authenticity. Mm -hmm. Uh, everything is is about an authentic authentic approach to to working with people and thinking about then you know what is it that you would want putting yourself in other people's shoes and and but it it, it comes from putting in front of going in front of a, a room of, of folks you know if you're putting on pretense if you're if you're if that authenticity doesn't come through then the then the connection with the students the adult students, the learners, is not as strong. You know, people want to see the passion. They want to see. They want to see the passion. They want to see the intelligence, uh, but but it ultimately they want to see the real person and learn from that real person because that then draws everyone into a place of openness, where they can be themselves. And you can have a real exchange of ideas. So for me, that's one of the first principles is is authenticity. You know, I. I I also uh, link to that is just, you know, one of my, perhaps the only Shakespeare I remember is to thine own self be true. Mm -hmm. It is another thing. And and how this is also one of the things I've said to you as well as we were yes. debating about how to so solve, a, solve a workshop issue that you were going through. And that is, you know, it's, it, and this also is interesting because one of the other things I learned when I got into the marketing industry, especially with, you know, the, from with, with when I was getting exposed to the agency cultures and all that. Yes. The answer to any question is always, Yes, and and that doesn't work in training. It doesn't work in training. Most people don't understand how good training experience is created and executed. And they come up with ideas, like customers will come up with ideas that they're way out there. You know, it's all about saving money and time and, and the expense of anything that's of quality. And so, and so, 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 you know, to thine own self be true translates here to, you know, if you know something's going to be terrible, you don't tell them it's going to be good. You tell them it's going to be terrible because <laughs> it's about leading people to a place that they may not know. And it may be more expensive and may require more time, but it's going to get them the result, the business result that they're really looking for. And that's the other thing about what I try to have in, 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 the, in the training that we're doing and why we have this practitioner philosophy is that we want concrete results. We want this yeah. to really mean that companies get a benefit because if the companies get benefits from the training, then they're not going to ever leave the ANA. That's really what this is all about. From our business perspective, we're giving, we're delivering training as a way for companies to love us and stay with us and grow yeah. from us. So it has to, you know, the training itself as a, such a key, key, crucial touch point of a a because it's 30 people in a room and might be a whole marketing, you know, department, 300 people over time. I mean, if we're going to have that type of intimate touch with a company's personnel, we better be delivering something that is going to stand out. And that, that, that ain't done if you're not knowing what you're talking about, delivering what you know you can do on and being authentic in my you know, opinion. Um, you mentioned the practitioner angle a few times, and I really like that because, uh, you know, there's a difference between studying marketing at a university with a professor who's ever left the halls of academia, right? That's right. And doing a training of, that is a real world training for real world problems by people who have actually banged their head against that wall, figured out how to get around it, and are now teaching that. Um, I, I think that that's invaluable. Um, it's, it's the difference between 
something concrete and something theoretical. That is exactly what I think too. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. And you know, I, I like to say if the, if the training isn't sticky, what's the point? You've got to be able to take what you've just, what's just come out of your mouth or what we've just done in a small exercise, whether it's an individual exercise or a small group exercise and put it to use that later that day if they have if their training is in the morning or the next day when they have to come back to the office and i'm reminding of another phrase that i've heard and you probably heard this one too mark people don't care what you know until they know what you care and that's about the authenticity yeah so so we as an organization and i'll i'll, I'll say we because i feel really really a part of this we struggled mm -hmm. in 2020 and the pandemic fell down upon us because we had to make this huge transition from what, at, at, you know, in 2019 and early 2020 was all in-person training. And now yes. we're all in this new world called virtual training. And yes. what we're talking on now, this thing called Zoom, no one had ever heard of, or very few people had heard of, and now everybody uses it. So talk a little bit about what that was like for you. You were, it's like, you know, the old saying, we're going to fix the airplane while it's up in the air. Well, yes. A&A was, a &A was, was up in the air operating with, hundreds of workshops, you know, 60, 70, 80 instructors. And now we had to do a pivot. Yeah. What was that like? How did, how did we do, how did you do this? I know how I did it. Cause I was, I had my little portfolio of workshops I had to do, but you had all of them. So what was that like? It was, <laughs> it was, a, it was, um, took us about four or five months to get everything. At least I shouldn't say everything. It took us about four or five months to, get the majority of the high demand topics converted uh we uh, we it was uh it was it, it, like you know part of me wants to say it was no big deal because everyone had to do it right you know when you think back on it though uh you know in a very short period of time i mean we 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 went from from you know no virtual workshops to about 40 or 50 in, in that four month, uh, four or five month period of time. Uh, it was a matter of writing a, a, a how-to guide about how to, you know, execute a virtual uh, delivery. It was training on a lot of faculty on how to execute a virtual delivery. Uh, the, you know, we, we, we were using Adobe Connect when we started doing this, which was, you know, the platform that we had, it quickly was proven to be not very effective for simulating a, a, a workshop environment it wasn't easy to use, whereas Zoom is super easy to use. Uh, and so it, it, we went through a, you know, a, a learning curve of, of both figuring out how we're going to work our own platform and then getting all the faculty acclimated to that platform. So it took it was a good it was a good amount of effort. But I think the, the other big thing was uh, that I will say I was proud of, of doing is that, you know, suddenly a team. My, I, I run a sales team, and that's what I do now. It's a, it is a, it is a B two B, marketing training services sales sales team that I'm leading, and you know the, it is a group that needs camaraderie. It builds from each other. They talk amongst one another. They share their best practices. You know, so being remote was you know uh, not good for the cohesiveness of my unit, and you know they hate me because I say, oh, I'm glad that we're working back in the office three days a week, you know, everyone seems to really want to be remote. No, I want us to be here so that we're feeding off of each other's energies and getting the collaboration in real time happening. Even remotely, you can't, it's hard. It's harder for in my case, you know, uh, but you know, we, we went through that and, and and what I felt was like the best change that I did was that is that I started to require uh, you know, 10 a.m. meetings with my team. And so every day we met at 10, we told jokes, we, thought about the day we talked about the day we figured things out but the morale issue was the biggest thing that i was concerned about was getting people connected and not to lose that cohesiveness and for a number of months we did these things until the business started to pick up again which started to be about september october you know we were doing on average about 30 workshops a month uh prior to the pandemic when the pandemic hit we did four workshops, six workshops. I mean, this is back at the very beginning when that was a big accomplishment. It was it was a huge drop off and it took us about another that next four or five months to get back to the pre pre pandemic levels of 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 uh, monthly workshop execution. And now you know we're now we're up to about 40 workshops, you know, every month now. So it's 
And it's been a mixture of 70% virtual, 30% on-site, which was a surprise to me. I, I predicted that it would be 60-40 on-site virtual when the pandemic started to wane and it was now we're talking about how do we budget for the future. I was using numbers of 60-40%. I've been proven wrong twice in a row now, so I'm throwing in the towel. It's 70% virtual, 30% you know, in-person. Uh, I have a strong bias to in-person because I think your personality, you know, all the things that like, we've talked about here are really much more easily observed and noted in person but virtual is an is a it's a good reality i'm not going to say the greater reality because i do have that bias towards in person but we've managed to make it work we still get the the good scores we still get you know application expressed in the virtual environment so it's just what i, I what i don't like about it is that you don't get the real connection that you can get with faculty looking over your shoulder and you know having real conversations that can happen spontaneously that are not really able to happen when you're doing it virtually. Now, to me, I'm those just, are the other things that make I up. I agree. As an instructor, I mean, Henry does, does instructions too. And I don't, Henry, you might want to talk about whether or not you've done this virtually or how much, but I've done the virtual, obviously uh, quite a lot for the ANA and on my own. And you have to learn new tricks. Yeah. And one of the one of the tools that I started using, which you know about, is a is an online whiteboard called Mural. But there are a lot of them. That's not the only one. There are many of them out there. I think it's one of the more popular uh, online whiteboards. But it's highly interactive, and you can use it in real time. It's yeah, not perfect, credit, Howard. You were the one that brought that to us. You know that whole really? idea. Yeah, I you, made, you, you were the only faculty that that brought an outside platform like that for us to to look at. You know, and you made it work you know, in your workshops, but, you know, we've been, we've been using Zoom and Zoom's tools, but yeah, you've been, uh, you know, well, you went through that whole, you went, you did a whole thing about how to be a virtual instructor too. Yeah. I, you know, I, I remember we did something for, for Grant Thornton. Was that one of the, I mean, even that was, year, the, that, that was, yes, that was a the year first, before the virtual workshop right before the pandemic. That was before yeah. we started to go there uh, full, full belly, but yes, that was right. That was, was that the same year? Was that, the, I think that was a year before. That was in 2019 that we did that. Yeah, yes. and it was, you wanted me to do this experiment and I kept pushing back. I kept saying, no, give me a little more time. Let me put this together. And I I found this thing called Mural and and it was rough. It was like doing, an, you know, like the first talkie. <laughs> we went from yeah. silent silent movies to a talkie. It's like, this is the first one. And we did it over the phone. Remember that? Yes, I remember that, right. Oh my goodness, talk about rough. But we learned a lot. Yeah. And I guess that leads me to the question, are, are, are you offering, is it, it, do you offer training to the trainers to become better trainers? You know, that's, no, we're not. Uh, we're not doing that. What we do is as we vet faculty, we have a pretty extensive, you know, vetting process now. Uh, but no matter how well you vet, the ultimate test is you put someone in a new situation and you, you have to see how they respond. More to the point you put them in a situation with five different members from small to large, from CPG to tech, which is what the ANA faculty must do. They have yeah. to teach to all these different verticals, all these different sizes. And then you really get the feedback on them. And when, 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 so when that happens, we don't have formal training, but as we observe scores, as we observe the performances, we will then give them, you know, we, we will more like, you know, snipers you know we find the ones that need it and then we we target them with the help that we can provide and that and you know, usually sometimes it's style uh sometimes it's it's uh just it's like you know a a graphic was said it was sometimes graphics need to be updated things like that you know but uh, you know frequently it's the exercises it's because the exercises for someone who's not been a real training practitioner are the hardest thing to, to, to really figure out. So it's, you know, that's why, you know, my team stays on these workshops, especially for the new folks that we have in our repertoire uh, to make sure that, yeah, yes, of course, the content, but see, usually you can figure out how smart someone is and how well they can articulate the ideas through the vetting process and just through talking to them. That's that's the easy part, frankly. But seeing how well they can conduct and handle an exercise, how well they can, you know, uh, handle people who are now giving them objections they have not yet imagined. You know, <laughs> those are the, those are the types of things that that you know we can help with. Alternative ways of answering the question, alternative ways of expressing the idea, 
or a different structured approach towards addressing the exercise or why it broke down and so forth. But, yeah. but so it's nothing that's concrete or organized. It's very ad hoc based on the needs that we identify. I learned very quickly that just tell a, a member, Jane, you ignorant slut, is not going to work very well. <laughs> that Dan is Aykroyd. <laughs> for for all of the fossils in our, yeah, right. our, in our listening audience. You know, um, Aykroyd, thank you for Dan that. Aykroyd. Thank you for that, Henry, because I didn't remember who said it, but I know that I had said that before, <laughs> heard that before. <clears throat> thank um, you, Henry, so I, might we, have just, I just might have been canceled if you hadn't put that into context for me. So, <laughs> so um, as we go went down pandemic memory lane, it was uh, it's hard to remember back to, I mean, it wasn't that long ago, four years ago, a lot of the trends, you know, like this meeting that we're having right now virtually online, it was already coming, right? But the pandemic just accelerated it. I mean, um, I came from, you know, in, I worked on the McDonald's business from 2008 to 2014 at a Miami-based agency. And during that time, I, fl I flew to Chicago almost every week and sometimes twice a week because that in-person was so important. And then when I joined the, my current agency and I have a client in Detroit, the Ford Motor Company, you know, the big presentations, they were in-person presentations because that was what was accepted. And even then I was already pushing our IT. I'm like, man, can we have like an iPad with FaceTime so that we could set it up at the table? So, you know, we could have, because not, you can't fly the whole team every time. Right. And, but the pandemic just forced everybody in. And, and so I think that there was something good about that, despite a lot of the bad that I, I attribute to the pandemic and a lot of the, the negatives, but you also mentioned something that I think is interesting, which is, virtual in the short term versus virtual in the long term so to have a team an employee team that is 100 percent virtual i think it can be done in the short term in the long term i don't think it's the best way you know to and I, so i agree with with your point but i think that for things like workshops where we're only going to meet one time or two days for a few hours I think it's great because suddenly it's a lot more accessible to a lot more people, right? Like you don't have to fly to New York, sit in a hotel room or send an instructor out to the client's uh, location. So I think that there's definitely a place for, it. of course, there are drawbacks. I think it's a lot easier to get distracted when you're sitting in front of a screen at home um, than when you're in a conference room with an instructor, everybody's just kind of focused in on, on the content. But I guess it's neither here nor there. This is just the world that we live in now, and and we we have to accept the fact that there's some some pros and cons to in person and to uh, virtual. But I do think on the net, on the on the whole, for training, virtual becomes really nice because it just makes it a lot more accessible to a lot more people. Yes, that is that's the huge benefit is the accessibility. The issue of geographic dispersion in our private, pri previous uh, mode of business was always one that for a certain segment of our membership, you know, our clientele was always a turnoff about what, what we did, you know, because we did in-person only workshops and it would require hefty expense for some of our members to fly people in or, you know, transport them into to a workshop setting. Uh, so having this as an option uh, is tremendously beneficial for them in particular, which also brings up, you know, the, the conversation, if I could put your guys' hat on, is one of the questions for this is also, so what do you think about hybrid learning, you know, both virtual and in-person delivery? And uh, this is one of those things where, you know, a little bit a little bit of my, of my old bias comes in where, you know, before the pandemic, I was like, in-person is always the best, always the best. And, and now, of course, I've been, it's it's not the case. I mean, yeah, it might be a little bit better, in my opinion, but it's virtual is really good still, right? But what about hybrid? And I will tell you that this is where my old self can come out in space, which is to say that I, I don't like it. I mean, we, again, we do it if if members insist upon it. If, they, if, if the circumstances dictate it, we will do our best. But the problem with virtual is, 
is I haven't yet met the faculty person who can both co be compelling for an in-person audience and a virtual audience at the same time. It is a big challenge to both when you're working with a room and engaging it, with the room it, and body language in the room. I, I can imagine it's very disruptive. And frankly, we put it as the country onto our teachers, uh, you know, like at the elementary and high school level during the pandemic, when some kids were starting to come back, but they still had to offer that virtual. That's what we did to teachers was basically you had to do the hybrid thing. And I think that they would unanimously say that's like a, that it's hard yeah. enough to teach virtually what you always taught in person, but to now have keep some people on a screen and some people in person, I, there's I think more than one, there's more than one hybrid though. And I think Mark knows what, what we're talking about here. There's hybrid where, there's 15 people sitting in front of you and five people on the screen behind you. That's one form of hybrid. Another form of hybrid, which I've had to do, which was maddening, was everybody's in the office, but they're scattered between five rooms and there are four people sitting in front of one computer. So you can only see one person, maybe two at a time, and there are two or three others who are not, they're, they're like this. Yeah, that you know, sounds like a you, disaster. You, you can barely see me, so you don't know if I'm even talking. And yeah. th then I have, it's how, how do I keep track of who's saying what? I don't even know who's in which room. So yeah. try to do try to do a small group exercise. Yeah. <laughs> it's it's crazy. So there's there's multiple ways of discussing what is hybrid. If it's 15 people in front of you and three people on the screen, that's a little more manageable. The three people on the screen behind me are still going to be ignored. Until unless they speak up, but with five people in four different rooms on one, on five different computers, oh, uh, that's a recipe for disaster. I'm going to say I'm. In fact, I'm going to do my level best to say no to that. And that's one of the lessons I that Mark has taught me. And I'm I'm not afraid to say this. I would sometimes say yes to an assignment that I had no business saying yes to, and I it ended up biting me in the ass, or I ended up biting my own self because I I performed very poorly. Because I was trying to do something that was just not doable. So yeah. learning to say no is, I think Mark was saying, you can't say yes. And that means you have to learn how to say no. So I think I'm open to doing these hybrid workshops as long as we're really clear on what that means. Well, and the other point is that the, 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 the person who is engaging you to do it understands that th there will not be universal satisfaction that that is an accepted outcome as long as the, the customer understands the limitations and they sign off on it. That's the key is they got to sign off on it. Yeah. All right, then we'll do it and we do the best professional job we can. But ultimately, we know it's hard. And that means that no matter how good you are, you know, things can happen. Yeah, I mean, okay. the, the, real, the reality is our clients or because I'm on the agency side, but uh, yeah. a, uh, advertisers, uh, brands um, are also living in a reality where their workforce now isn't all necessarily in the same city anymore where they right. used to be, right? That's so right. they might have a preponderance of their employees in a city and you might send an instructor there to give a workshop, but they might have half a dozen uh, team members that are working remotely in far-flung cities around the country so that's another just reality i guess we have yeah. to, and, we have and, to and deal look, with th these are the realities that we can't we, we, you know, this is like this is this is the world that we're given and so it's our choice of how to live in it so 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 in the in this thing it's like to me it's always make sure people understand what is a risk you know and that that risk is, is accepted you know do your best job and then and then you know we go from there yeah an another reality or another flaw in this whole system is your members are, and I don't know what the percentage is, but I'm going to say 90%, 95% of your members are marketers. A very tiny percent are ad agencies. Even when the merger, when the DMA, what, four or five years ago? That was pre-pandemic. Yeah, it's, it's not that extreme any longer. Uh, it, is, it is more uh, about 60, 60, 70, you know, 30, 40. Is the, the okay. mix of marketers to to agencies and others? Well, I guess for my personal experience, so this is anecdotal, yeah. not necessarily scientific. In my tenure of doing workshops with you, and I've done well over a hundred workshops in the seven years that I've yeah, worked yeah, with you, easily. 
uh, I've worked with one ad agency, maybe two. Oh, yeah. So it's interesting to me. I mean, Hen the reason that I know Henry is that Henry, like so many other practitioners in our in our field, is self-taught. I mean, I, I didn't get any formal training in copywriting. I'm a writer. I'm a, I studied poetry and I was a writer, but I didn't learn copywriting the way a lot of kids do today. Henry is the same way. He found my book online, uh, learned something, a couple of things from my book. So I guess I hope he got his money's worth. Presented it to his boss at the agency where he worked over, over 10 years ago, and then invited me to come out and do a workshop. This is long before I even knew you, Mark. Mm -hmm. And that's how we got started. So we we kind of learned, I learned how to do this because I was a, a creative who got tired of reading bad briefs. I needed to learn how to write a brief. Henry was a, 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 a learning the, the skills of being a good strategist and saw my book as a way of helping. Um, so a lot of the people that we talk to on our show are like that as well. They came to our industry later in life, you know, in their thirties and didn't, and didn't know a lot of stuff beforehand. So we're finding, I'm finding that the people who really need this training in my particular training in, in, in creative briefs are the ones who are not reaching out. Henry's the exception. It's the ad agency that I think the young strategists need the training and they're not getting it and they're not reaching out, but you know, you can lead a horse to water. You can't make it drink. I can put I the offering out of, there. I think part of that is a function of the economics of the typical ad agency. Number one, we're much smaller organizations than the clients we work with. Mm -hmm. um, and then within that, the people that could benefit specifically from a creative brief training are a very small population within the ad agency. So it's just a, a numbers game. Whereas with a client organization, you know, there may be 10, 20 people writing briefs at a, at, at a you know, at a decent sized brand. Um, whereas that's not the, the case necessarily at an agency, unless you get into one of the bigger agencies and then those bigger agencies do have some sort of formal training program or at least have bosses that are mentors and, and doing ongoing training with, with their employees, yeah. which is yeah. why what I, what I try to do, you know, is when I have uh, direct reports is I, I train them the way I want them to work. Yeah. So, so, you know, the hard part about training and why it gets is one of those first things that's cut is, you know, so what's, where's my payoff of it? What, what is the, what is my benefit? Now sales training is easy. And it's simple. You train 20 people and you don't train the other 20 and let's see how well they do. Right. It's very easy in sales to see the value of training, but it's hard, especially in, in marketing to what's the value of training. Now, maybe you have metrics around how many rewrites you're doing with your agency. And you know that if you improve your briefing, you can get a lot better creative more quickly. And you can, you know, you can measure that as a, as an impact of a training of training. Okay. What about digital advertising? What about so many other things that are that are out there that are hard to actually measure in terms of training as an impact, direct impact towards the bottom line result? This is one of the struggles of, of, of training as a whole uh, and it, not just marketing training, but in particular, it, marketing is in there as far as it's difficult to show the value of that. So what I like to do when I have this opportunity to talk to people is, you know, what's the turnover in your organization like? Mm -hmm. Because a lot of turnover is attributable to a lack of professional opportunity for those employees to grow as an individual within working for you. Yes, it's money. Yes, other things. It's also how well do you make me feel like I'm special, that you value me, that you're going to invest in me and give me the opportunities to grow. And so a lot of turnover is going to take place in companies I and mean, other, cult other cultural issues lead, contribute to, to, to turnover, but lack of developmental opportunities is a chief reason why people leave and go from one company to another company. It isn't just money and it isn't I, just power. It I, is I, about I, development. I, I, just want, I just want to finish this point. I want to just finish this point. You can calculate the cost of turnover, mm -hmm. right? It could be anywhere from 50 to 150% of one salary, depending on how, what level you're looking at. Well, if you're if you got a lot of turnover in your in that in that lower level, right? 
Where's your, where, that's your bench strength for the future, right? If you don't got a good bench, it's going to be always very expensive for you to replace people. So you want to focus in on developing the bench strength. You want them to be the folks that grow into leadership roles, which means that you need to give them something that tells them that they're valuable. That's solved by training. That is solved by giving them the opportunities to choose the learning pathways that they want to take so they develop their skills. Yes, you run the risk that they might take those skills someplace else. Yeah, but, but if you invest in that, you can then reduce your level of turnover. And that's where a lot of the value of training comes from. And and it's you attract and, and you attract better people. I mean, we started the conversation talking about PNG. PNG loses a lot of people and they're out there. They've tra trained people for, but the high quality Quality people want to go and work at PNG, so they're, they're definitely uh, attracting high. I couldn't agree with you more. Um, I think one of the other things related to what you're saying, and we talked about this with Julian Cole, who's a strategy instructor and mentor, um, mainly working with ad agency strategists, is the whole idea of imposter syndrome. And you mentioned a lot of people working in marketing are coming from sales or from product development or from other areas that are not marketing related. And they feel like they don't really know what they're doing and having training gives them security, right? Which brings you happiness to your job. There's nothing worse than feeling like, shit, I don't know what I'm doing. I'm going to be found out. That's right. Yeah. That's exactly yeah. Right. Well, Mark, let's put, let me ask you to put on your crystal ball. I know you don't, you don't, you, you've, you've, said that your your crystal ball hasn't worked a lot in the past, but you know, mine doesn't either. But I'm gonna ask you to, to look into it anyway. What do you see in the next one or one to three or four years down the road for the ANA? Are we are we you think it's gonna remain the 30, 70 split between in person and virtual? Are there other topics that you think are going to emerge? What's what's well, your prognostications I, you know, here? Well, yeah, yes. I think that virtual is going to be the dominant way that training is delivered for the foreseeable future, uh, simply because it's good enough and the premium experience of in-person uh, is premium. And so it's simply, it's I think it's a cost consideration, fundamentally less than an experience consideration, right? And yes, you want some things to be in-person and indeed that does happen still, but I think that's not going to change uh, at all. As far as topics, uh, you know, I I mean, technology is going to be the is going to be the main topic center going forward. I can't be more specific than that. It's not my area of expertise to kind of predict that type of stuff. Yes, and I warned that I didn't want this kind of question. But AI is something that uh, is way like so when i started social media was just kind of getting people just started getting acclimated to social media you know oh we got a social media workshop big deal it was a big it was a huge achievement for us you know finally uh it, of course now we've got multiples you know but and the social media is completely accepted as a functional area you know so so it was all very ai the speed of ai is shocking to me you know social media kind of kept it kept it came in you know, then became a force and then now is, you know, a dominant part of every conversation in marketing. AI is going to be the exact same thing, but more so, I think, uh, the speed of, of its change, the, man the manifestations, the, uh, you know, someone has said to me, the do democratization that AI allows for because everyone can benefit from it as a tool. Uh, I need help writing, writing grammar, gr grammatically, you know, that's never been one of my skill sets. AI can help, uh, you know, simple, simple need like that, and it can help in the complex as well. It's, it is something that everybody can benefit from, and it's a scramble now to figure out, well, how do you use it, use it well and uh, use it effectively? So, uh, yeah, that's, that's the safe thing to say is that AI, you know, is going to be hugely important uh, in, the, in the years, uh, immediate years ahead and, and, uh, and, and forevermore as it constantly evolves, because what I've learned is that we're just at the beginning of what AI can mean. And there's a long road ahead for what AI can do. And if that if that development of that technology continues to blossom and grow, then it's just gonna be a matter of just constant catch up as industry tries to, to embrace it and make it work and profit from it going forward. You know, as far as uh, MTDC goes, in terms of the future uh, and where, where we are is that I think that uh, what we have created here is starting to get noticed more so by members because it is we're no longer that that workshop shop that I talked about 
and we started to get into the strategic work with with capability diagnostics and you know, the, the assessment tools that we have. The, the 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 way in which this unit now and and what we're doing at the ANA in terms of how we've grown and responded is that we're much more focused now on the learning and development profession and supporting that profession in all the ways that it needs support, which does not mean just uh, that workshops. That's one solution. It's blended learning, meaning workshops, webinars, other types of ways that you distribute and you know content. It's 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 about measurement. It's about reporting. It's about so many different things that are important to the learning development function to make learning come alive for the reasons that we've discussed in this call to promote employee retention to 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 you know, reduce the cost of of turn or turnover to have a competitive advantage that starts to spread throughout the industry and becomes the place that the young people want to go to to work, which is right. what P and G is. Yeah. You know, so, yeah, I mean that that's kind of. That's you know probably not the the not not the best answer I want to give about futures and so forth, but you know that's that's kind of like that's my authentic answer of what I do and don't know. <laughs> that's a that's a great answer, and I I think that it, you know the more that we get the word out that training is available, and then we have a lot of people who are are enthusiastic and authentic about wanting to do the training, the better the industry is going to be as a result. So Mark Liebert, Senior Vice President of Marketing, Training, and Development Center at the Association of National Advertisers. Thank you so much for joining Henry and me on The Brief Brothers. Thank you very much, guys. Good stuff, Henry. Good stuff, Howard. He's Henry Gomez. And he's Howard Eibach. And together, we're The Brief Brothers. Till next time. Till next time. Bye-bye.